Hi. <laughs> Who was that kid? <laughs> uh, so my name is Davis Mallory. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys saw the real world at all. I'm not sure if you did, but raise your hand if you did. So if I know. All right, OK. Well, so um, in 2006, I was on MTV's reality TV show called The Real World. Seven strangers picked to live in a house, have their lives taped, uh, find out what happens when things stop being polite and start getting real. Um, and as a kid, you can kind of tell I was always a, like always singing and talking. Anyone who's ever known me is I'm always singing and talking and making making music. Um, you know, music has been something that I grew up in. My mom is an artist. She's a painter. She's taught art lessons for almost all my friends my whole life. My grandmother's a water painter. My mom's a painter. My sister's a painter. Art is just like in our family. And on my dad's side, it was music. Music was in my, my dad's family. Um, everyone plays an instrument. My granddad plays the banjo. Um, my brother and sister can play the guitar uh, or the piano. And for me, my instrument was my voice. Uh, I grew up singing in the church choir. Uh, as a little kid, I had stage fright. And my mom has home videos of me crying, like the one kid on stage crying. Um, and even in high school, during talent shows, I was uh, asked to be in a bubblegum chewing contest, and I was too afraid, and I sent my mom up on stage. <laughs> she, so she did it for me. So I mean, you know, fear was playing a part in my life. And um, music was also a bit of a business for us, though. Uh, my dad's sister's husband was uh, the longstanding manager of Christian recording artist turned 90s pop star Amy Grant with the hit Baby Baby. And as a kid, I used to get tickets to see Amy Grant and get to meet her backstage. I'd spent uh, summers at her house, met her kids. And when I grew up, I wanted to be Amy Grant. I wanted to be a Christian singer um, turned radio pop star. And uh, I sang a cover of her uh, hit, a uh, Christmas hit, but it was called A Grown Up's, Grown Up's Christmas Wish. I, used, I learned all the words. I recorded it on a tape, sent it to Amy Grant. She heard it. She wrote me back a nice letter saying how great it was. I went into school the next day, I think I was a fourth grader, and I was like, in my show and tell, look what happened to me, you know? And when I dream, my dream was to be a famous Christian singer. Um, and during high school, in church choir, I auditioned for something called Ensemble. It was five guys and five girls, and it was an a cappella group, and we would practice every week, and then we would perform our a cappella song for our church. And we toured Poland um, and we toured the US uh, singing at schools uh, these songs that we practiced. And I worked at a Christian bookstore during high school. Um, it's called Sweet Spirit. And I was that kid, the Sweet Spirit kid. I mean, my password actually is still Sweet Spirit for a lot of my things. I need to change it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that was me. That was me. That was that kid. I mean, I spent all my high schools going to. Uh, I mean, I spent all four years of high school going on medical mission trips with my church. I was a good little choir boy. But um, in 1994, 1995, I had a slight suspicion there was something a little different about me. Um, while boys were out playing kickball, I was often playing four square with the girls. And I felt like, I didn't know what it was for a lot, lot later, but I felt like there was something off about me. Um, and in this time in history, there wasn't really a lot of openly gay people. You know, it wasn't until 1997 that Ellen DeGeneres came out. It was in 2002 that Rosie O'Donnell did. And then in 2005 um, is when I came out to my peers. Uh, so almost 10 years later. Um, and I took that and I had a great warm welcome from my friends from college, my family, not the same as a very strong Christian family. They were of the mindset that it wasn't something like an eye color or a hair color or, you know, a talent, like a voice, but of a, of a, it was a decision. Um, and I started going to Christian therapy and, um, you know, I tried to change that about me. And I lived a lot of my life kind of in hiding of something that I knew it, I couldn't change, but a lot of people thought I could, and I tried to. Um, and one of my peers from Ensemble went off to become a Christian recording artist, my dream. And he ended up getting nominated a couple years later for the Christian version of a Grammy Award called the Dove Awards. 
Uh, his name is Christian Stanfell. And I watched as he went after what I wanted to do, but I didn't go after it because I was afraid. I was afraid of being outed and having some scandal happen and ruining my f a fan base I could have had. You know, my dream was to be a Backstreet Boy. I, I look at my yearbook when I was in high school and everyone wrote Nick Carter. Or like, <laughs> <laughs> you're, look like a, you're the Backstreet Boy kid. I mean, I remember a girl from my high school coming up to me trying to recruit me to become a, in a boy band and I was so afraid I didn't want to go on any auditions because I was living in fear of this being found out about me. And I lived most of my life that way. I went to college. I was pre-med. Um, and I was a business major as well. And secretly, I was still dancing to Christina Aguilera every night in my room. But like, outwardly, I was like, I'm just going to do the American dream. I'm going to become a doctor, and I'm going to make a lot of money, and I'm going to like, you know, do that kind of life. But that wasn't for me, because I felt like I was an entertainer. Like, I had, to, I had to be in music. And I spent, you know, I auditioned to be on The Real World, and I got on. I, I went on, honestly, with a bit of anger towards my family and a bit of a goal to get into working with MTV. Um, the show was a wild ride for me. I was, you know, kind of afraid of what that even experience would be like, being so ex open and so exposed on such a grand scheme. And I was, and this was 2006, I had just come out. Um, and so, you know, I, I, that, I, and then I found that my greatest success was being on a reality TV show, which wasn't what my potential was. You know, I was smart, I was talented, and yet all anyone ever thought of, I lost my last name, by the way. My last name was from the real world. Because I, everyone would walk around like, is that Davis from the real world? Davis from the real world? Davis from the real world? And I felt like that was who I, my identity was. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time wondering, like, maybe I should have gone on auditions for American Idol or X Factor and said, like, that would have been maybe putting me more in line with where I want to go with my life. And when I finally met the producer, and I think people think the producer of the real world is always in the day-to-day -day aspect of the show, trying to tell you what to do. You wake up, there's a script. It's not like that. You wake up, there's a cameraman right in front of your face, and as you're walking to go brush your teeth, he's following you in front of your face. And when you want to go and get the groceries or somewhere, they're walking backwards with you. And, <laughs> and we, were, we were doing Outward Bound excursions, and so we had these amazing gurus of guys, like, as we were walking, walking up mountains. They're like walking up mountains with us, and we feel bad for them. But I mean, that wasn't, the, there wasn't, it wasn't, there wasn't like, cre there wasn't creative like control. It was, it was real, uh, which was kind of bad when we did bad things, because we couldn't blame it on anyone else but ourselves. But I finally met the producer of The Real World when the show ended, and he asked me, actually I asked him, what should I do now? Because I got casted for the show, and I had like all these dreams of what it would do for me, and his response was, whatever it was you wanted to do before the show, go do it. I thought about that. I'm like, what is it I want to do? I wanted to act, and I wanted to sing when I was a kid. And I you know, spent some time after that trying on audition for things, and I just didn't get the part. Like, I wasn't putting in the hard work that I needed to, and I admit it, that I was, I, I kind of thought like I had a silver ticket into things, but it wasn't, that's not the way the world works. Like, hard work delivers good results, not just like, you don't get a lucky break. And um, around that same time that I was on The Real World, MTV had just created a TV network called Logo. And there was a big party in LA and I was invited to it. And it was all the, at that time, kind of like gay celebrities. The cast of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy was there and Queer as Folk and Lance Bass and like anyone else of that time period. And I got to meet the president of MTV named Brian Grading, who famously found South Park and put it on air. And he asked me, what is it you want to do now that you've done the show? And I said, you know what, sir? I've always wanted to be on or work around MTV. So he lined me up with a set of job interviews. I came to New York. I interviewed at the talent department. I interviewed at the music video programming department, news and docs, and then I interviewed at Logo. And I left New York without a job, and I felt defeated. I either wasn't qualified, there wasn't any openings, or, you know, it just wasn't in it for me. And I felt really defeated. And I went on for the next couple years doing normal jobs. I worked at a bank. I worked in medical sales. I worked at IBM and consulting. And meanwhile, I felt like this was probably a great path for myself. Like I could have a nice car and I could, you know, 
have a family and do this kind of style of living. But it wasn't for me. I felt like there was something better for me. I felt like I knew the only way I would be able to live this life and be happy with the way I lived is if I was living it with like performing and singing and acting and doing things that as a kid was like in my blood and was in my dreams. But this like America's like climate towards being gay had kept me from going after it. You know, and a lot of things changed in the next couple of years. You know, we in, you know, 2010 was when Ricky Martin came out. And 2012 was when Frank Ocean, the first R&B singer, stepped forward and came out. You know, in 2013 is when Jodie uh, Jody Foster came out. And then we had the repeal of DOMA. And I realized that America's just still right in the middle of historical changes. And I have this kid that's just trying to figure out where I fit into the puzzle piece of it all. Um, I started writing a music blog, had like five readers for a little bit, and I would go to all these shows and just try to be at the forefront of music and just digesting things, finding out about artists like Marina and the Diamonds and Ellie Goulding, like a long time before they became big artists. Um, I was at a music festival and I met a girl who recognized me from the real world and asked me what I was doing today. And I was like, well, you know, I love music. I write a little music blog. And she was the female voice for a website called After Ellen. And there was a male website called After Elton, both owned by Logo, and she said they were looking for a male writer. So I started freelance writing two times a month. I would write a column that kind of reviewed songs, videos, and interviewed artists. And I got to interview Ellie Goulding, Janelle Monet, artists like Nervo, Graffiti Six, among others. And then I started interning for free at a booking agency called the Windish Agency. And I came in and created a tour for an artist, which was cool because it often turned into the real tour the artist would go on. There were kind of these tours you would make to let them get a visa and come to America. And after these experiences, I was like, I'm gonna go back to New York. I'm not gonna let that first round, like, you know, get me down. I heard about all these stories where it's like, you know, people that stay tried and true and keep persisting make it. So I went back and I set up a two week stint of job interviews, one at Sony Music, one at EMI Music, one at Vivo, one for a publicity company called the Carpel Group, and one for a management firm. And I set another week up in LA, and I was gonna go and interview at Interscope, and I was gonna go find, Robin's manager was a friend of a friend, and I was networking, you know, and I was like, I'm gonna go get, some, I've gotta make this happen for me, like I can't do what I'm doing anymore. And I came to New York, and I got offered the position of the president of Astroworks Records assistant. And for the last two years, I have worked at a record label that I dreamed of when I was working at that Christian bookstore in high school of one day having this opportunity for myself. And it has been nothing short of fulfilling. There's been moments where I've cried when my boss has said something to me out of joy that this was happening because it felt so fulfilling. The night that Swedish House Mafia sold out Madison Square Garden and I was only a few months in on the job, and they were this big, big act in America. Everyone was buzzing about them. They were the biggest EDM band that was out at the moment, and they just sold out Madison Square Garden in 10 minutes. And he comes to me as his like, fresh assistant, and he gives me my tickets for the night and my VIP wristbands, and he goes, are you ready tonight, kid? It's your first big show. And I still remember he walked away, and I got so emotional and started crying. I was like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, I can't believe this is real. And for the last two years, I've worked in the marketing meetings where they've talked about, you know, Empire of the Sun's new album is called Ice on the Dune, and the song's called Alive. Like, what's the thing that we could tie into the word alive that makes people feel alive, you know? Or we've worked on the Chemical Brothers DVDs, or Kylie Minogue's Live at Abbey Road, and how it's like more acoustic, and it meets a different demographic. So like, how can we tap into that demographic, you know? It's been an amazing place for me to grow, and feel, and touch artists, and meet artists, and talk Talk to artists. And I moved to New York City with not a lot of money, just like everyone else says, but biggest dreams I could dream of, and met tons of artists trying to do the same thing I'm doing, performing every night, going out, you know, kicking it, doing anything they can. I took DJ classes, and I started DJing for free. My, my ex-boyfriend's a music producer, and he's like, kid, there's a long line of people out there who want to do exactly what you're doing, and just because you did a TV show doesn't mean that you get to do it. You got to work for free, and you got to build yourself up from the bottom and go up. And I did. I just took anything I could do. And a couple weeks ago, I DJed for the future hopeful mayor of New York, Christine Quinn. I've DJed at Pasha and Bloomingdale's and ABC Home, just like just playing my music out, being an artist, and it makes me feel so alive. 
and I've been working on my own music. Like, I've met so many producers here in the city, and I'm, you know, working on songwriting and working on, you know, just like being an artist. And I realized that at 29 years old, I can't tell this story as good as I could at 80, and who knows where things will go for me. But, you know, I feel like the biggest thing is, is if you look at the planet, the majestic mountains, the deep blue oceans, all the diversity of wildlife on here, someone created this place to be a place of greatness. And you can walk around New York City and you can see the extremes. You can see the bums that spent the night on the street, the drug addicts like chattering in the parks. You can see the Wall Street bankers. And it's so easy in this life to give up on your dreams and to just give in to temptations and things that are bad and become a failure. But I think that God intends for us to be great. And I want to just talk about that for you guys today. Follow your dreams and try to be great.